Uh, hi there. Hello, everybody. Hello, login. Uh, actually, uh, my CEO from uh, Wix have spoken yesterday. Uh, but in case nobody heard who we are, we are Wix. We are probably the largest website building platform in the world today with uh, 47 million uh, websites and 1 million new websites being built every day. What I do for Wix, I head the business unit that developed Wix App Market and the SDK and some other projects inside Wix. Before that, I had three startups of my own, and I've basically been doing product management since the 90s, which, although as an entrepreneur, you get to do basically anything inside industry, product management has been always my passion. Uh, now, I want you to imagine for a second uh, a world where 90% of the buildings are not actually finished. Well, believe it or not, that is more or less the situation inside our industry, inside the software industry, what I like to call the software crisis. So if you come to think about it, the facts are kind of shocking. 90% of the software projects are never finished, meaning basically they were never delivered. And almost 100% of our projects are not finished on time. Now, if you look, I don't know if you have friends that are from another engineering field, like from civil engineering or electrical engineering. They kind of laugh at us on our delivery measurements and standards. So basically, my purpose in this presentation is to share with you my method, the method I use at Wix, in order to assure what I called delivery-oriented product management. Product management systems that are oriented towards delivering high-quality products on time. Who, who this presentation is basically designated for? Anybody who wants to create a product, entrepreneurs, product managers, etc. Before I begin, one thing I want to emphasize, what I'm telling here is by far not the only method existing for delivering products. It works for me, it works for my business unit, it works at Wix. There are other methods as well, like anything else that you've been taught, look at it uh, skeptically and try to find your own way towards delivery. So basically, when I talk about delivery-oriented product management, the first thing I try to convince my product managers, as well as anybody I'm working with, is basically be a no-man. A no-man is exactly the opposite of a yes-man. What yes-man does, yes-man always say yes. They say yes to their boss. They say yes to new ideas. They say yes to new features. And I'm going to talk a lot about saying yes to new features. What I encourage you to adopt is uh, a method of be no man. When you get a project, a product, the first question I expect you to ask is not why we need this product, but actually, do we need this product at all? Maybe the project is totally redundant. Maybe we shouldn't do it at all. Uh, when you're asked to enter a feature into a product, always we're talking about what we are missing in our product, what extra features we should add inside there. The approach I am trying to create is what extra features do we have in this product that actually disturb our users? What actually is overwhelming our user interface? What redundant things we have there? What can we take out? Again, a no man's approach. And again, this goes from the planning of the product, from developing the code, and, uh, and also from testing the product. I am a great believer, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, about testing the product from every perspective, doing A-B testings and BI and usability tests. Now, when you do usability tests, the natural tendency of us as product managers is to ask our users, what are you missing in my product? What do you want me to add? What other things you need? I encourage you to adopt a different approach. What things in the product you are not using? What can I take out? What makes this interface more complex and can make it simpler? Try to think about it when you try to design, to design your project as something that has three axes. In one axis, we have the budget of the product. In the other axis, we have the HR of the product. How many people are actually developing this product? And in the other axis, we have the scope of the product. How big this product is? How many features does it have? 
So what happens mostly in our software industry, and that's the reason why 90% of our projects are never finished, and 100% of our projects almost are never finished in time, is that when we are confronting challenges, and there are always challenges, trust me, we are saying, let's get more developers. Let's increase the access of the HR. Let's, uh, let's increase the time. Let's deliver it later. It was planned for June. No harm done. Let's deliver in August, October, November, next year. So what I say, no. If you are in a crisis, and if you're doing a product, you will be in a crisis. What I encourage you to do, basically, is cut the scope. We had 10 features in our product. We don't have the time and the money and the HR to do that. So let's launch a product with five features inside it. Now bear in mind, I'm not talking about cutting the quality of the features. Your design should be slick. There should be no showstopper bugs. The product should be still high quality, but smaller, more minimalistic, with less features. So basically, I'm going to talk right now on what I think is the life cycle of a product, which is basically the core of product management. And I'm going to talk in each and every stage on basically how you adopt the no man attitude. Now bear in mind again, when you listen to this, be no man. Meaning basically question everything I say, don't take it right. It works for me sometimes, it works for some other people in Wix sometimes, and it may work for you but may not. So the first thing when you design a product is actually research. And what we are basically researching, the first thing is, do we need this product at all? And we're doing it from a skeptical perspective. Once we decided that, uh, that we need this product, the first thing I do, I try to look at something that is a benchmark. It's very rare that we are developing a product that is a totally new thing in this world. In most cases, we are developing a product that other people did, or to be more precise, did something similar. For bringing nothing new to the world, there's no point in what we're doing. That's the no man's approach. And there are basically two ways to look at it. One attitude is an attitude that, is, that works. He's saying, I am like something. I am similar to something else that's existing. That's my benchmark. And I will look what to change, what to take away, what to add to this similar product. That's actually an attitude that I don't like. The attitude I like is, I am different from this product, and I'm going to do things differently. You are trying to do something new? Look at the, most ex at the most popular and successful product in this market, or, in a sim or the most similar product that is the most successful in this market, and try to be as different from them as you can be. These are the two attitudes. Both of them work. I like the second one most. And the third thing, and the most important thing in this stage, is talk. Talk to other people. Talk to your colleagues. Talk to people with experience in this field. Talk mostly to the users, to the potential users of the product. You don't believe how many inputs a simple sp uh, talk with a user that's going to use your product can give you. The next stage, which is kind of at, my, at least from my perspective, the core of product management, the essence and the heart of product management is wireframes. Now, what is basically a wireframe? A wireframe is a visual representation of your product. It is not designed. You're not talking about the way the product is going to look eventually. But you're talking about the screens of your entire product not designed as a scheme. I'll show you an example in a second. All the buttons, all the menus, all the actions, everything inside the product should be inside those wireframes. Now, it should be in details. Don't leave the details to the designer. It's probably the biggest mistake you can do. All the details are there. It should be in scale. I once had a product manager that designed a product for me. And there was a ticket there that he thought is the heart of his product. The ticket was supposed to be very small on the screen. There should be like nine tickets like that on a, on a single screen. What this guy did, he took this ticket and he placed it on one big screen of a PowerPoint. I asked him, why do you do that? So he said, you know, I'm showing this to you and to the management. I want you to see what's inside the ticket. So I told him, you know, eventually you're going to show this to the users. If they cannot see it in the small ticket, why do you show it big time? So in scale. And another thing that's important inside 
uh, this product that it's going to be the MVP of the product. MVP is a shortcut for minimal valuable product, meaning basically the product with the less features that still gives value to the users. So your wireframes are this minimalistic representation of the product, but it includes everything. And another important thing to know about them that, that you should put strong emphasis about three situations in the product. One that we all do is the full product. Let's say if I design a blog, I'll show the blog with all the posts already in it. But that's easy. The most important stage in the product is actually not when it's full. The most interesting stage in a product is when it's new. Because it's the first interaction of your user with the product. And that's where the user is going to judge you. Either for using the product or for the dead end of oblivion where they're going to uninstall you, delete you, kill you, and not use you anymore. So not doing the new stage of this blog where it has no posts in it inside your wireframe is kind of totally wasting your time because you're skipping the most important stage. And another important stage, which is also more important than the full, is what's happening when something goes wrong. And guess what? That's another trial point. Because when something goes wrong, and as I said before, always something goes wrong, something goes wrong, the user sees you in this interaction, what, he's, what the screen is going to look like. Do you going to have a 404 notice? Are you going to talk to the user? Are you going to tell them something? Put it inside your wireframes. It's probably the most important stage. Because that's another stage where the user may delete you and send you to the oblivion of like no usage. That's an example for a wireframe for one of our core products in Wix, our app market. Uh, I actually encourage you to go after the presentation to Wix.com, visit the editor of Wix, click the fourth button, and see how similar this is to basically what we have today. The right order. This is something I've been talking a lot, a lot, and a lot about in Wix and in other places, and yet people are doing it differently. What is the right order to develop a product? So for any one hour you spend in your wireframes, your designer is going to spend 10 hours on designing them, and then your developer is going to spend 100 hours on developing them. So it makes total sense, if you're short on time, and you're always short on time, yet delivery-oriented, to make the wireframes first, the design second, and only once you have the wireframes and the design, go to development, just to not spend scales of work time. And yet, People are doing it all the time. And by the way, not for the wrong reason. Product management are very passionate about what they do. We are in love with our products. So we want to run forward. We want to run to development and see it's happening. I know that happens to me as well, all the time. But yet, I find that we should aspire wireframes first, design second, and only then development. So another guidelines for wireframes, MVP. Less features of high quality. The term I like to use is, it's better to have half the feature and product that kicks ass than double the features and half has product. And you know what? This is probably the most important thing I'm going to say here today. Kill. OK, you have your very important features. They don't have to be in your product. You have your super important features. They don't have to be in your product. Only your critical features have to be in the product, and they have to be perfect. I'll give you an example in, from the app market, the one we've seen this wireframe before. We launched an app market inside Wix, a way for companies and startups to put products into our editor. By the way, any entrepreneur is welcome to talk to me afterwards. We'll shove his application into Wix, and we'll distribute them for you. The most important one, a very, very important thing inside an app market is a rating system, right? A way for the user to rate them. But guess not. It's not critical. The app market brought value to Wix users without a rating system. So we launched it earlier without a rating system, and we, adding the ratings, we added the rating system at a later stage. The product still was slick. The design was good. There were no showstopper bugs, but there were less features. Bear another thing in mind. I have some developers here that work for me, because most of my development is actually here in Lithuania, believe it or not, of my business unit. And actually, if there are good engineers in the audience, we're not interested. But if there are excellent engineers in the audience, talk to me afterwards. I have a job for you. Uh, it's hard to create a product. But believe it or not, it's harder to maintain it. And every feature you add into the product is a ghost that's going to go with you forever. You're going to continue to maintain it and to support it. And if it's not critical, just leave it out. 
Trust me, it's the internet world. If it's really needed, your users are going to nudge and they'll ask you for it. So anytime it's better to leave it out than to leave it in, as long as the products provide value to the users. Another thing I like about wireframes is the sanity check. And again, I'll go back to this wireframe to give an example. You know, when you talk about a product and you have no wireframe to look at or no design, I think it's a blurb. But when you look at such a product, it's enough to send it to your colleagues and to your potential users. And guess what? The first sanity check you have here is basically, uh, do I understand this? If I understand this, then probably the users eventually will understand it. If I don't, they won't, and that's the best sanity check you can have. Another sanity check is the scale. Does it fit into the screen? If I have tons of features that does not fit into the screen, what good am I at? And that's the best sanity check you can have, and nothing can do it better for you than wireframes. By the way, and when I talk about the size of the screen, an important thing to know in our internet world is a term called default. You know, we have a screen, we can scroll down, but there is this line that is under the fold. Now, guess what? Every feature that is under the fold is invisible until you scroll down. So when you design the product and you do the wireframes, know where very well where your fold is. And that's another sanity check you have. And the last sanity check, and again, the no man approach, is that once you look at your wireframes and you know how your product is going to look like, I want the discussion again. Do we really need this? Is this product valid? Because there is no point and no time on wasting resources, design and development wise, on products that are not needed and features that are not needed. OK. Another thing I want to talk about when you talk about wireframes is two ways to design your interface. And I want to present you with two methods that exist in our world today. I call them the iPhone and Android methods, but uh, that's just a nickname. Both Android and iPhone are actually using both. And the basic question you should ask yourself when you're designing an interface, a user interface, is how many options do I give to my users? And there are two attitudes here. One option is the Android options. I give my users lots of options. It's nice. They can configure the products and make tons of decisions. And you know, every person is different, right? We are individualists. We want every product to be maintained. You can change everything in your Android phone, right? But the important thing to know when you are going on this approach of putting lots of options inside your settings panels and, and interfaces is that there is a huge price you're paying there. First of all, and the most important thing, you're getting an overwhelming interface. It's harder to interact. Many people say, you know, it's for technical people. Trust me, technical people don't like overwhelming interfaces as well. Everybody likes simple, slick designs. Second thing, You'll have to develop all these features and options inside your interface. And this means more maintenance and more questions and more support and ghosts that's going to follow you for eternity. So the other attitude is actually we are doing the minimal settings we want. We are basically deciding for our users. Now it's true, we'll decide probably for 80% of our users. And 20% of the users are not going to be happy with it. But guess what? I actually prefer the 20% of the users are going to complain, I don't have enough options here, than 80% of the users are going to complain, this is too overwhelming, I don't understand this. And you know why? People may complain they don't have enough options, but they still stay with the product. I don't like the fact I cannot choose my GPS and video player in my iPhone, but I still stay while overwhelming interface actually take you away. But yet, both these attitudes are valid. I kind of like the second one. Anyways, whatever you decide from this approach, just draw them in your wireframe so you can see them and actually know what the price is. OK, now actually, as much as I talk about wireframes, I want you to know that there are two different approaches in the world that actually are still used instead of wireframes. One of them is specs. People are actually writing long textual documents describing their products. Believe it or not, it's still happening today, not in the Middle Ages. Uh, as you may understand, I do not like specs. 
What are the pros of the specs? I've heard rumors arrive to me that some people claim it's easier to check lists on specs. I actually think it's easier to check lists on, on wireframes that are visual, but I don't know. People claim that. Another thing that people say that in specs, the textual document actually makes sure you cover it all. I don't believe in this either. I'm an atheist when it comes to specs. But the claims are there. What are the cones of the specs? First of all, nobody reads them. Trust me. I've seen lots of 100 pages specs and nobody reads them. They're not clear. There is no sanity check. There is less info. It takes huge amount of time to write them and they're very hard to change. Because in a wireframe you see what you change and in a spec you see tons of text. So I do not like specs, but if they work for you, share with me how. But there is another approach that actually does work. And this approach is saying, kill the wireframe stage and jump directly into design screens. There are advantages there that are true. You actually save a work phrase. You don't do a wireframe. And you'll have to do the design anyways eventually. So you're kind of saving yourself some work. And you will see exactly how the product will look like. It's even more precise, sanity check wise, than a wireframe. What are the cones? First of all, it takes a lot of time to do a slick design, and changes take a lot of time. You see your product flow, it might not work for you. You'll have to go back to your designer to change it. It will take him tons of time. And that's a big issue. Another thing, when you design a product, there is aesthetics and there is functionality. My belief is that aesthetics should serve functionality. And actually, I believe, both in architecture as well as in product management, that the functional design is also more beautiful. The risk you're taking when you're skipping the wireframes is that aesthetics are going to take over functionality inside your considerations. But yet, I have seen amazing products created with skipping wireframes and doing designs. By the way, I never saw an amazing product created with a spec. OK, we finish the wireframes, then we go to design. And the reason I'm not going to talk about it is because we're in Lithuania. I want to share something with you. A year ago, my CEO came to Lithuania for the first time to log in. Then he came to me and told me, David, let's build a development center in Lithuania. I called Ronen, the guy who actually does things in our business unit, and I told him, let's build. Yeah, yeah, why not? And I told him, build me and a development center in Lithuania. And actually now my two core strategic products are being developed here. But the reason why I was so turned on on Lithuania, and I use this term because actually Lithuania well, looked sexy to me, if you like, was the very high level of design you guys have here in Lithuania. So I'm not going to talk about it. You guys are doing great in this aspect. Don't change anything. Keep on the good work. Pre-development. Uh, after we're finishing design, before we go to development, we are doing a stage called pre-development that is a critical stage, and you do three things there. And while I talk a lot about MVP and doing less things, never skip these things. They are probably the most important thing you have to do. One, create an A-B testing for your product. Do you know what A-B testing is? A-B testing is the ability basically to stop guessing and start knowing. You have two options. You can guess which one is better. It's a very stupid thing to do even if you're a smart person. And if you're a stupid person, it's a totally stupid thing to do. The smart thing to do, if it's really critical, is to do them both and actually test how your user responds to them. And that's A-B testing. And define this before development so it will be embedded into your product. By the way, every new feature you're adding to the product, well, maybe it's not that good. You know, we are no man approach. A-B test it. If it does not improve, don't do it. By the way, if you cannot measure it, it means it's not important and don't do it to begin with. Second thing, define business intelligence. Business intelligence are the tools that allow you to know automatically what your users are using and what they're not. Guess what? If there is a feature in your product that your users are not using it, you know what you do is it? You delete it and you don't have to support it anymore and you have less development. It's great. 
And the third thing, define monitoring. Monitoring is a very basic and critical thing that you don't believe how many good product managers tend to forget. It's basically your ability to know if your product is working at a certain stage or time or not. Bear in mind, your users are there all the time. If your product is not working, they will leave you. They will delete you and send you to the oblivion. So have a good monitoring system to tell you if it works or not. And then we go to development. There are three things I want to talk about development. Uh, for one thing is MVP, minimal. Talk to your developers and ask them how much time it's going to develop this enormous feature. And maybe they'll tell you this is going to take us huge time and maybe we can do it in a shorter time. Don't give in your most important feature. Give value to your users. But if there are things that are not critical, ask your developers if they're very expensive, consider taking them out. On your core product, the thing that gives value to your users, do them and do them the best way you can. Make them slick, highly designed, work perfectly. But differentiate between the two. That's the art of product management, basically, differentiating between the two. Second thing. Your developers are actually an amazing product managers. Talk to them. They'll give you great product tips on their product. That's a very important thing to do. Sometimes we think of them as machines that consume coffee and give an output as code. That's not true. They're actually really good in giving you tips on your product. And they'll help you drop features, which is the best thing they can do for you. Thirdly, you also start thinking about QA and you define your showstoppers. There are some bugs you can live with. We are delivery oriented. We can live with them. But there are some things you cannot know, you cannot, you, you cannot allow, differentiate between the two. Another important thing you should do in delivery oriented product management. And then after that, and after you QA your product and development is ready, you launch. And you know what's the first thing you do when you launch? You do a party. I remember vividly the first time I launched my first product in my first startup that was my own, I was actually in an airport. I couldn't party. I was on my way from Israel to the States. I sat on the floor of the airport. I saw the product. I connected to Wi-Fi and I cried. It's like having a baby. Uh, maybe second best. I have two kids. It's a little better, but it's an amazing. Try to party. It's lots of fun. It's probably for, for product managers who are passionate, it's very exciting moment. But you know what you do when the party is over? Before you go to sleep, you're going to hang over tomorrow, use the product. It's unbelievable how many people are not using their products after launch. Use the product. It's probably the most important thing you can do. And then post-launch. You know what you do in post-launch after the launch? You use the product again and again and again and again. You check your A-B testing and you check your BI. Then you look at your users as you're using the product. And uh, you look at what they're using, but you look at what they're not using. And guess what we'll do to the features they're not using yet? We're going to delete them. Because then we don't have to maintain them and support them. And that's all the essence of basically this presentation. Then we're going to the second phase of the product. You don't know what's going to be your second phase of the product. You will have this feature in mind that you think it's very important and you didn't have time to do that. Don't be fixated on it. Just see what your users are missing or what your users are not using and put it as a second phase, mostly 30 days after launch. And then basically, it's an ongoing process which you adopt every principle we did here. I have two minutes for questions, so if anybody has one. They told me the audience here does not like to ask questions. Okay, so you're not going to ask questions. So basically, uh, I have uh, three things I want to ask you to do before I'm finished. One thing, Wix has a great product. Uh, look at it, play with it, and then uh, talk to us through our support features and tell us what you do not use and what we should take out. We like to hear these things. Secondly, one of my responsibilities in Wix, I'm responsible for the Wix app market. The Wix app market basically allows any startup that is designated towards small businesses to put their product into our platform as a seamless part of our editor and make it a part of us. We are probably, because we have 47 million businesses that build their websites with us, the best distribution channel for you and we'd love to have you in. Talk to me and my team who sits over there on the couches afterwards. We'll explain you how to do that. It's very easily. And the third thing, 
I am looking for the best engineers and QA people in the audience to come working for us, which is a great place to work at. We're segmented into small companies, startups, so it's the combination of a NASDAQ company that does things that are awesome with a startup atmosphere. It's a great place to work, it's lots of fun, trust me. I worked there for four years, it's the first time I worked for somebody else and not for myself. Kind of a miracle, because it's lots of fun. So join us. We are changing the world of small businesses and their websites, and it's fun to be at. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.